Today we have with us Srinivasan Jain, who's been with NDTV since 1995. He was working as a lowly, how did you put it, as a lowly trainee Flanky, with Times of yeah. India after having graduated from college and uh, NDTV picked you up. That's right. And you've been through quite a few phases with them. Now tell me, how did this one come about, this truth versus hype? Well, basically, uh, I had, uh, uh, for a brief stint, I was working as the head of profit, our business channel, because there was a transition thing going on there, so they just wanted somebody to take charge of it. And uh, so I did that for a year, and then I had to come back onto the mainstream political news, which is what I do. And so we were just discussing formats to see what How we could do. How did you sell this idea? Because it's not uh, what marketing people would call a sexy... Uh, you know, it's funny. It's not to get ads. Well, it's not necessarily something I had to sell per se. I was talking to the Roy's about it, and uh, the idea was to do something which is different from all the f programming we already have. And we already had so many talk shows. But did you have a tussle with marketing on this? No, no. They were okay with it? Well, you know, the way it works in NDTV, at least so far, is that we editorially design the concept of a show, and then we just go ahead with it, and then marketing has to kind of figure out how to, to sell it. Really? Yeah. yeah. That sounds very old school. Yeah, yeah. So That's shocking. Touch wood. <laughs> That's good, uh, obviously, uh, for us. You did mention that when you were working in profit, yeah. there was this element of advertorials going on and uh, you, you were quite shocked when you arrived there. In fact, I wrote a piece recent, not recently, in April, yeah, yeah. Uh, about the program on uh, NDTV Profit called Big Spenders, okay. which is an advertorial. It looks like, I, I would guess, it looks like paid for uh, a, a story. You know, uh, uh, in fact, a program. The whole okay. program is on one company, and it's and it sort of showcases all the luxury goods and interviews, uh, not interviews, right, allows right. the person, the owner, to talk about his product and promote his product. Okay, Big Spenders per se is not an advertorial show. It's supposed to be a luxury lifestyle show. But what it ends up happening with li luxury lifestyle programming is that it doesn't really look at what it's covering in a very critical way. It just ends up looking very pluggish. Yeah. But it's not an advertorial in the sense it's not paid for. What I was referring Are to... Are you sure? Because yes, yes, why I'm would sure. anyone do a program which is so chaplusy and sucking up and promoting with no balance at all? Okay, let me give you an example. Not even an opinion on taste. Okay, let me give you I an mean, The most grotesque things are being shown. I don't care how much they cost. They're ugly and they're ferociously ugly. And, and they're promoted. So there is no balance at all. How can it not be a paid-for show? It's not, because it's, it's not a paid-for show. It's just, as I said, that there's a lack of a critical gaze when you're covering luxury and all of that. And I don't think that's just unique to us or anything. I mean, if I Are look you at sure the, about this? Do you think I'm maybe sure, they're sure. fooling you? No, 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 not at all, not at all. At least the time I was there, it was certainly not paid for, and I'm sure it's the same now. What I was referring to was uh, there were these other programs that we would do which were advertorials in the sense that a company would sponsor them and then they would be very much in line with the company's activities. Like the one on insulin right. wanted a 12-part series on diabetes. Right, that's right. Okay, but that's something that we nixed because you know, the brief time I was heading profit, we were trying to figure out what to do with them. So temporarily we put a hold on them and we decided that if we are going to do them, then we have to clearly indicate that it's an advertorial. So well, you know, so far nobody has indicated anything on television in, se in the sense that when there's a conflict of interest, when there's, it's an obvious advertorial, yeah. in print people do still do that. But not always. But not yes. always, but, yeah. but they do. But even they do, do it sneakily, but they're very, so tiny that nobody can notice. Right. And Mint has made a huge step forward in putting it in a box That's and right. saying that this is not copy, this is an ad complete sponsored thing which is a big step. Are we being transparent enough on television? Fair Do you enough. think so? No, I think that there perhaps needs to be far greater disclosure on television than there is. I agree with that. What is the difference in reporting on corruption about politicians and corruption in business? Well, I think, uh, firstly, uh, you know, what tends to happen is that I'm talking here more from the context of a business channel, uh, that you are also reporting on these companies and all of that as part of your daily news. And they're giving you access, and they're also sharing with you their results, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole kind of uh, set ritual of how you report on them, uh, just in terms of the routine. 
And so what tends to happen is that when you start asking tough questions or you start reporting on corruption and charges and all of that, then they immediately try to indicate that perhaps you uh, might be forsaking that access. I think with politicians, there's a, a tradition of having an antagonistic relationship between the media and the press. They're used to being taken on. They take us on, we take them on. But with, with, co with the corporate world, I think that that tradition has not been there to the same extent. There's generally a degree of comfort which doesn't get ruptured enough. And I think that's happening now quite a lot with all these they camps coming out. They expect good stuff to be written about them and are very shocked when it isn't. That's right. It really so, shakes them up. They're yeah. not used to it. Yeah. So, but you also wrote about or said that um, journalism is an anarchic profession. Do you think we've lost that element? No, no, I don't think so. I think it's still anarchic. In fact, in some ways, it's become more so. This is like an endless thing. Have things gotten worse or better? And it's there's like there's really no one answer to it. But if I look at the sheer amount of journalism that's now happening because you've got more I mean you've got more newspapers now more television channels you've got websites magazines and all of that I think in that collective sense some good stuff is also happening you're getting uh, occasionally fantastic investigations you're getting long-form writing of the kind which wasn't there earlier at least I don't remember magazine like Caravan for example. That's coming back now. Caravan, Caravan open, is coming open back, ran yeah. a very long piece written by you I'll get to that. Uh, you said at your um, at, you went to some leadership Tides Leadership Summit. And in that, uh, you mentioned that during election time comes the usual demand for funds. This is something we all face. I'm just giving you an example. You could just consider doing this. We all know political parties come to extort money from us. But if even one single corporate company does a sting operation that suppose a minister comes to you demanding money and you record it and you give it to us, imagine the impact of that. Unless something like that happens, yeah. nothing is going to change. Now, I saw the response on YouTube after you said this. And it was such a disappointment that the business, all the business people over there were highly cynical, said, yeah, yeah, that'll be the day because we would dis be destroyed if we did anything That's like right. that. Context to that was that this was happening in Coimbatore in Tamil Nadu and this was very close to the elections and when I was there privately a number of those CII types who were there were telling me about the levels of extortion how much it had gone up how much politicians were actually wanting stake in business interests now as opposed to just demanding money and so I'd heard this right throughout so then when I was on stage and we were having the usual discussion which can become a bit pointless about where all this leads up to I said as an example of what you can do is is that that if someone comes to you for money you try and but what did you think of their in response way. their response was so it, negative it was it was it was disappointing it was disappointing i mean i was also being provocative right it was a public gathering no, and all of that now if you don't want to individually take that risk then certainly collectively as a corporate community you can turn around and say look this has to stop yes you go together to the chief minister and say these are the following ministers who are squeezing us for money etc etc and see if that yields anything but it's better than passively sitting and allowing that to happen and then whinging yeah, about nobody, it year after year or election after yeah, election. Nobody enjoys giving away monies but the problem there is the creating a unity amongst business to go together and do this because if it's if That's two right. people two business houses don't and then become the favored business in one particular field then you have a problem again. That's, so there's no, a true. question of unity. Yeah. Tell me, what kind of corruption do you see within TV channels? Corruption. Have you faced any yourself? Oh, Has no. anyone tried to fix the story with you? I mean, if you mean in terms of a bribe, no. I mean, you've had obviously people call you to say, look, don't carry the story, whatever. I mean, the information is rubbish, etc., etc. You're working on a story which has potential ramifications for Whoever's, whoever you're naming, they, you will get calls to say, look, don't carry it or water it down, etc., etc. But then it's your editorial call. If you feel the material is strong enough, you go with yeah. it. Now, at the GQ Awards, uh, you started. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You started. Oh, um, God. Huh? You spoke, and uh, while you were speaking, you said that um, uh, candlelight marches, etc., are not enough. Is n and it was the time of the elections, and you said. I don't want to sermonize, but I would suggest you people go out and vote. Obviously, this was in, in Mumbai. Right. And the minute you said that, when you said, I don't want to sermonize, people applauded, meaning we don't want to listen to your sermon. So I was really irritated and angry that the lack of 
Oh, was that what it was? Yes, I thought they were actually was. okay. That's what it was because it was basically we want to have a good good time. We are not interested in listening to lectures about go out and vote. There is seems to be uh, uh, aggressive. Leave us alone. We're going to have a good time. And uh, they clearly said that we don't want to listen to you. Okay, I read that differently. I thought they were applauding Journalists do and have cheering. Journalists to applauding. Yeah, that's right. I thought they were applauding and cheering me. Clearly not. <laughs> but no. Yeah, I just felt it's it's probably something to be said in the context of the fact that yes, there have been, there have there were the attacks and there were elections and there are elections coming up. So and Bombay, particular parts of Bombay have a notorious reputation for very low voting turnout. Turnout was very low. In South Bombay, yes, other parts of the city was better, but that's that's a traditional pattern. So it was made in that context. It wasn't anything particularly profound. But then it was an award ceremony. You have 30 seconds. Did you feel awkward getting that award? Yeah, it was a bit yeah. strange. For yeah, for journalists, for a journalist, I think, it's strange. Yeah, any for journalists, anything to do with style or that kind of thing does put you in a spot because you feel. Well, the only difference was that they had these awards, and I checked this with them. They said that these are actually not so much for style, for style, which is something that I don't think I'd ever win. But <laughs> it had to do with categories. Yeah. So they had a media category, and they had one for politician of the year, artist, etc. Because it's GQ, it's framed in a different way. So. Yeah. Um, most journalists moved on from 2611. You went back to it in your very long article, right. seriously researched interviews. Right. Uh, in Open Magazine, yes. Rigor Mortis. What motivated you to go back to check what happened to all the people uh, who were accused right. and the mismanagement of the prosecution? This was actually not so much in the context of 2611, but there were a second set of bomb blasts uh, which happened in Bombay last year. And uh, so that was a chance to look at the entire pattern of bomb blasts that have hit Bombay since 93 and look at what happens to the judicial proceedings because what tends to happen is you have a bomb blast and then you'll have the usual studio discussions, candlelight marches, calls for justice and it's over. And then it's over. But you have to actually if you really want change in quotes or you really want to know what's happened you have to follow the judicial process which is a dogged, painful, uh, almost boring, a tedious thing that drags on for years and to see what happened to all those people. And, and then when you actually article, do... It shows that all these terrorists yes. actually got, got... Well, terrorists in the sense they were the ones who were accused, but because the cases then collapsed over a period exactly. of time due to a number of factors, many of them are either out on bail or the cases themselves have entirely collapsed. And typically when you have a bomb blast, they're under immense pressure to produce quick results. So they lapse into a very familiar pattern of arresting people in droves, naming, in quotes, masterminds. You'll often find one blast will have many masterminds. And you found that there were almost carbon copy confessions. That's right. In one particular instance, uh, the confessions were, you know, word to word, which yeah. is why that particular case, the Ghatkopar case, actually collapsed. So you have that so whole pattern. So you send these accused terrorists out in, into the free world um, just because the prosecution was not up to par. Well, Madhu, you have to remember that in some cases, they may not have even got the right guy. In the process, you've actually tainted someone who's innocent. So, so you did a, a piece on uh, the nightlife in Mumbai. You didn't get an interview with uh, Doble. What do you think of that whole incident? Well, uh, as far as Doble was concerned, what had happened is that we, uh, the police commissioner had gagged him just uh, at that point when we were in I Bombay. See. But he gave us an interview, and he gave us the first interview that he'd ever given since the controversy began. So it was a kind of a trade-off. But uh, there were two aspects to it. One is, of course, that you have absolutely absurd laws governing nightlife in Bombay more than any other city. And so most of the time those laws are not enforced because if you did, every single club and restaurant would be illegal. So you have a strange it's sort of nexus. It's illegal to drink without a permit and everybody gets a permit. It's illegal to drink without a permit. It's illegal to actually serve alcohol in a restaurant. The permit room is supposed to be, the bar is supposed to be a separate walled off area. You can have a DJ license, you can have a DJ but you can't dance. This is a law. You can have a discotheque license, but you can only have 10 couples on the dance floor at any time. So you have these crazy laws, Who and they've not been in? enforced. Muraji Desai? Well, different. there's a Bombay Prohibition Act, which dates back to the formation of the Maharashtra state. It was a colonial act meant to govern sort of toddy making and all of that, and that stayed on. So that's one problem. Then you have a Bombay Police Act, which looks at things like DJs and, and so on, which it shouldn't. The police should have nothing to do with deciding whether you have a DJ license or not. So these require changes to the law. 
The separate aspect to that is that you have this whole tension in Bombay between, to put it very crudely, Mumbai and Bombay, mm -hmm. where uh, a certain section of Bombay feels that, or, or Mumbai rather, feels that all of these clubs and all of that are part of a culture which is not of the cities. And there's a certain political gain to targeting these places and attacking them, which I think politicians feel caters to their whatever, politics of chauvinism. So there's that element to it as well. There's just one more thing about the Doble incident which hadn't really been reported much, which is that prior to his targeting these bars and clubs, which are a more elite, a smaller pool, he had actually conducted a series of raids on what used to be dance bars. Now they're called orchestra bars. Mm -hmm. And he's arrested 2,500 people in the course of a year. 2,500 yeah. people. Dhoble and Dhoble, the Social Service Achha. Branch, mm -hmm. which is a huge number, right? Completely off the media radar because these places aren't as glamorous or as sexy for the news as, uh, you know, the more well-known nightclubs. Yeah. And obviously, in most of those cases, people have not been booked properly. There's no solid evidence. So they're all out on bail. But that was a huge police action. And, uh, you know, that's again something we try to bring out, that it again shows you uh, the sort of motivations behind what he was doing. But it also shows you the media blind spot in reporting something like the Dhoble phenomenon. What do you think of corporate money coming into uh, news organizations? When the Ambani's put money into TV18, Birla puts money into TV Today, well, living media, the to India Today group. Yes. And uh, now, uh, NDTV. No, obviously, those are, those are legitimate those are questions. Concerns. Yeah, those are concerns that. Uh, journalists working in that atmosphere That's right. would be wary of that. Ab kya yeah. Are they going to fiddle a story? Or do will we have to do PR jobs for their company? These are legitimate questions that do come up when you're working in an organization. No, absolutely. But as far as, at least personally speaking, as far as I'm concerned, and I think most journalists who are working in NDTV, we've never had a situation where we've been editorially told you can't go after X or Y because there's some investment or there's some kind of financial relationship. That's that's just but not happened now. I don't know if that's happened in the other places, mm. especially after the kind of investments that have been made. Because remember, those are not just buying a, a chunk of stake, 13, 14% isn't that much, but that is virtually underwriting all your debt. So that is almost tantamount to ownership in yeah. some of those cases. Yes, it is. And that has different implications. Yes. So uh, tell me, one of the most serious things that we are facing right now is after the Radia tapes, after the Times of India went into this mode of selling editorial space, it's now coming from the top that it's okay to sell uh, editorial space, it's, editor it's, it's okay to uh, uh, make deals with private treaties with politicians before cam uh, election, during election campaigns. Where do you think it's going and how do you think we can rectify this situation to bring it back to good journalism? I am actually not so deeply pessimistic in some blanket way about our profession. I think there's a lot of malpractice, but there are also people who are doing fantastic journalism. So it's not like every time I open a magazine or a newspaper, I just see reams and reams of paid copy. I see occasionally a reasonably well-written story. I might even occasionally see a fantastic investigation or some great piece of long form or even something great on television or a, or a, or a great debate. So I don't think it's all of a lost cause. I think what's happening in a strange way is that because you have so many media outlets, I think partly that competition is itself forcing people to produce better journalism. It's something the Times of India has realized. That's the shocking part. Yes. I think the Times of India has realized, realized that, that if you want to survive, sells. yes. So ultimately, your newspaper really people are picking you up to read you for news. They're not waiting to, they're not picking up only to read advertorials of how so you now, covered page Ever three. since I noticed that Times of India is doing good journalism, I've got even more scared because <laughs> the lines become so blurred that you really don't, before you could tell that this is editorial space sold or this is a planted right. story. Now it's so mixed up with good journalism that it's, it's uh, more difficult to, to figure it out. Right. So, and it's not just the Times of India. I mean, quite independent of the Times of India's own impulses. There, as I said, there are several instances of good, and a lot of it happens outside this Delhi bubble in which we inhabit. And I think something like News Laundry would be doing a great service if it could actually look out for those stories and for those journalists, many of whom are completely invisible, and, and bring them to light, because they certainly are out there. So, uh, having not planned to become a journalist, are you in the place that you want to be? 
Like, do you have goals in jo in journalism within the profession that you would like to achieve? You know, I don't know about others, but I just take everything on a literally day-to-day -day basis. I think journalists generally tend to be highly restless, malcontent creatures. No matter what you put them in, they'll always be whinging and griping about how they're not happy. But putting that aside, I think what I've been doing for the past year with Truth versus Hype has certainly been something which is hugely satisfying after a long period of time. I think something about just going out and doing old-fashioned grassroots reporting, visiting remote parts of this country, all of that stuff is just fantastic. Like when I had this whole experience I had of profit, the first time I actually got to run a channel where you actually look at your newsrooms and you see the journalists there and most of them want to just go out and do kick-ass stories, you know. So it's, it's ultimately also a function of what's the brief you give your reporters, what kind of but do they reportage you want. Do they research enough? Do they know enough on policy? Do Not they everybody. They're good reporters, they're bad reporters. They're those who you, who you have to kind of kickstart and those who I think of as, as self-starting. You don't have to tell them anything. And those they're are the already guys working yeah. on something or the other all the time. So those are the people who are going places. Well, those are obviously the journalists that you want to work with, right? It's fantastic as an editor if you get people like that. So but now you're on work. your own, right? With, yes, uh, with truth and hype. Well, I have a small team, but yeah. Okay, I wish you all the best, Sri, and thank you for your time. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks.